Welcome back to Read, Return, Repeat, a Read ICT podcast. I'm Daniel Pee Wee Warty. And I'm Sarah Dixon. And today, in an episode titled A Plate of Culture, we're going to take a closer look at Category 9, a book about immigration. Our guest today, Nina Mukherjee, first now, moved to the United States with her family as a young child. And she is the author of the Kansas notable book, Biting Through the Skin, An Indian Kitchen in America's Heartland and Green Chilies and Other Imposters, which was released last year. She was a Fulbright Global Research Scholar and has won the MFK Fisher Book Award, Grand Prize for Culture Culinary Writing from La Dame de Escoffier, and more. Her book, Biting Through the Skin, is about how her family ended up in Pittsburgh, Kansas, of all places, in the 60s. This was before many stores had an international food aisle, and you couldn't just find curry on the shelf. Her book weaves food and culture together with stories of growing up Indian American in rural Kansas. And plus, there are recipes. Can't wait. All right. Hi, everyone. And hi to Nina. Thank you so much for joining us today on Read, Return, Repeat. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. It's nice to meet you. Um, so Nina, tell us, you are primarily a food writer. Um, can you tell us and our listeners a little bit more about your work and what inspired you to follow this culinary path? Sure. Um, you know, it's funny that you asked that because I don't know very many people who maybe there are now, but at least uh, early on, who pe- writers who started out to be food writers specifically. A lot of us have kind of evolved into it because of various reasons. And I think I fall into that category. I I, um, was raised in Kansas, uh, something I just, you know, I'm very happy and proud about. Um, But at the time, it was a place uh, that was a wonderful childhood, but there were very few people like from my family's background around me. So I think I early on got really interested in cultures and and differences in cultures and also where cultures are alike. And I often saw that over the food traditions or between the food traditions. So I, I guess I started out really wanting to write about boundaries of cultures and how they meet and how people maybe cross them and where they find connection. And somehow that uh, just always seemed to lead me to food because food is such a wonderful lens to see that. And it's also opens up a lot of other stories as well. So uh, I guess I came to it organically that way. I was trained as a journalist and I covered all kinds of things, but I always was drawn to cultural stories. And then it just sort of, you know, um, just led me to to food. And I'm, uh, I have really been enamored with that topic ever since. There's a lot of ground to cover with food. I feel like (laughs) you've got lots to play with. It's yeah. It's really like a interesting common ground that a lot of people like everyone likes rice. So it's like, (laughs) (laughs) everybody likes bread. I love the chapter on bread. Um, Um, you grew up in, you said you grew up in Kansas and specifically Pittsburgh, Kansas in the 1960s. What was it like growing up as a Bengali immigrant in the American Midwest? Well, uh, you know, it was wonderful to tell you the truth, but um, it was just a different era. You know, if you think about um, all the issues we have with immigration um, have kind of evolved with our nation as we've kind of also grown up as a nation. Uh, but at the time my father came to Kansas, or actually he first came to Chicago, um, it was in 1957. He was among the first um, of the professional Indians that came to this country. When my mom and brother and I, after they married, uh, my parents married, they we all get, got to Pittsburgh in 1963. And I think I'm pretty sure there was about 12,000 Indian people in the U.S. at that time oh, across wow. the whole nation. And most of them were not in the Midwest. And um, so I didn't, um, I guess, you know, growing up in the Midwest meant that I had, I was a Kansas girl. You know, I rode my bicycle. I roller skated. I uh, was fascinated with mimosa trees and cottonwoods <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had, I went to 4-H, I loved my schooling, you know, all my friends. So I was a Kansas girl, but behind our front door, 
especially in my mom's kitchen. That's when I saw my family's homeland, which was very different than my homeland. My homeland is Kansas, but um, theirs is not. And so my connections to my family heritage came alive to me through the senses. And that's all around food. So it was aroma, it was texture, it was temperature. All of those things triggered um, India for me. And in my case, it made me learn uh, so much about India that I kind of indirectly. So if you think about it, you know, we're all children in the Midwest, most of the, probably you too, as well as I. And so you, we learn early on, you know, about pullets and maybe what we eat at 4th of July is sweet corn, because that's maybe when, you know, what they used to say, that's when sweet corn was knee high, you know, so that's, you know, all those food um, triggers. We know what we eat at the holidays because it ties to our agricultural cycle or our climate in some way. Well, I knew those stories because I grew up around them, but I didn't grow up around those same kind of cycles in India. So I had no idea what they were, except when my father would say, maybe it was a rainy day or a cool day, and he would ask for a particular dish called kichari, and it's a rice lentil dish that you you know, you can either use ghee or butter. And it's very comforting, it's kind of stick to your ribs. And he would always ask for that on a rainy day. And that made me suddenly kind of indirectly understand what it might be like during a monsoon in India. You know, so I I wouldn't have known that unless mom made that dish at that particular, that kind of weather to give my dad some sort of connection with comfort. And so you learn a lot about all kinds of things just by knowing you know, the comfort foods and the cycle of foods in your home uh, place. So I guess growing up in the Midwest to me was two worlds. It really was. It was what was outside our front door. But then it was also what happened in, you know, in the kitchen and how I learned about family story through food traditions. I love that. I mean, food is definitely what brings us together, I feel like. Or it's one of the things. Yeah. It's, it's a common thread. Um, and so I love how you just framed your whole, uh, you know, immigrant experience through food. Um, and obviously, you just talked about how food is such a big part of your identity. Um, what other things make you feel connected to your Bengali culture? Yeah, you know, as I was just saying, it was kind of two worlds for me. My parents uh, did have uh, occasional meetings with people from India, um, maybe monthly or quarterly at, at events in bigger cities near us, like Kansas City or Tulsa. And so I did see other Indians, but my daily life was pretty much uh, Midwestern. But, you know, if you went inside my house, uh, you might, um, you know, if you opened a closet door, <laughs> you might see some lovely embroidered fabrics or my mother's saris hanging in a closet. And those those were definitely uh, those tactile experiences were definitely India to me. And um, so I early on associated India with color and beautiful fabrics and um, and tasty food. So it was all sensory to me. And I, I don't know that that there's a few tangible things like the like the fabrics I just mentioned, but a lot of it was intangible. I think that's really interesting how you were able to connect with your like the, the items around your home play into the culture too because like I had that growing up like my parents were from Oklahoma and like things yeah. reminded us like like we have like this like Oklahoma State porcelain cowboy guy it's yeah. like so I didn't grow up there but I have a association with that through that absolutely um, that's what I think is really interesting though is I, I wrote about my family story, but I feel like everybody's family story, it's just, it's similar. I mean, you reveal different backgrounds through your each individual family. It, I, I described it one time as being little pockets of culture. And everybody's family is a pocket of culture within this big American landscape. And so if you just open that door a little farther and kind of let those aromas come out, <laughs> you learn so much because everybody's family has a different story behind it, different heritages, different, um, different favorite foods, different people who would have made those foods. Um, maybe different stories about why those foods were important. And I just, I just love that. To me, that's, that's makes the world come alive. I think we just found the title of our uh, episode, <laughs> Pocket of Culture. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. 
Um, in Biting Through the Skin, you discuss returning to India and feeling a sense of alienation from your cousins, but then compare it to the experience of being different from the kids in your hometown. Immigrants, and especially first-generation children of immigrants, often have to deal with the dichotomy of originating from one culture and adopting another. How are you able to balance this? Well, I think um, the balance was pretty decidedly in, in America. <laughs> I pretty much grew up as a Midwestern kid. and. Um, that was for various reasons, but I think there's a lot of loss involved with something like that. It It is um, um, maybe the er era uh, also of immigration at that time. People tended to feel like they had to make a choice if they were going to be Americans or if they were going to hold their home culture. And at least for my parents at that time, they thought it would be better for my brother and I to assimilate and um I, I think that we benefited a lot from that, but we also did lose something with that. And I, because I've been lucky, I've been able to reconnect with my Indian heritage. I always connected with it because they spoke Bengali at home. Um, I They didn't necessarily insist we speak Bengali, so I lost the fluidity of the language. But, you know, kids are pretty motivated to know what their parents are saying. So I, uh, I kept the understanding of the language pretty well. And, um, you know, so it wasn't that I lost everything, but I I don't think I have that culture. I didn't have that cultural fluency uh, of somebody who was raised there or even spent significant amount of time there and also in the U.S. I was pretty much always in the U.S., just occasional visits back to India until I became an adult and was able through this wonderful Fulbright program, get I was able to go for three seasons and live there. And I think now I feel like I have a blend of both fairly strong in me because I experienced it firsthand. I was like boots on the ground, saw the rhythm of how things worked, actually uh, connected with people there that a little bit more um, solidly, I guess, than, you know, remote kinds of occasional connections. And that was just such a precious gift. I just, you know, it was amazing to be able to do that for me. I think some of those are the stories that uh, really stuck with me is your your stories of going over as a child and seeing it through your child like eyes and then um, getting to meet your family and extended family. And so um, from your book, those are the, the parts I think that other than the food, really, no, I think all of it, all of it stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. You're like the best. <laughs> <reader>. <laughs> Great, I'll put it on my resume. <laughs> so um, as you were talking about like the assimilation isn't as like with immigrant cultures currently with like assimilation isn't at the forefront as it was when you were growing up. How do you feel about like today's immigrant cultures uh, being able to like celebrate their own culture more than you were able to? And yeah. it, um, I, it's a very good question, you know, and I, it's hard for me to put myself in those shoes since I didn't live that or haven't lived that. But um, at, you know, even then there was a lot more of communities, um, Asian communities, Indian communities on the coast than there were in a small town, smallish town in the Midwest. That was kind of unusual. Most Indians went to cities. Um, so I really was like, I felt like a little bit like an island, you know, of a small um, family experience. But I think Indians for, for a long time have had communities um, of their own culture, depending on what state they're from in India and so forth in the cities in America. And I think now a lot of immigrants can, their kids can grow up with that surrounding them if they, if they choose that. And they, they, uh, you know, there's just more people from Asia in, in the U S I don't know exactly, but the last time I looked, I think in the 2019, uh, timeframe, um, there was, uh, let's see, I want to say almost 3 million people from India in the U.S. Oh, wow. So compare that to 12,000 when I first came. So it's a lot different environment. And I have to also say a lot more Americans know more about Asia now than they used to. Mm -hmm. That I, it, It's just my personal experience. I may be completely wrong. And, and certainly in certain uh, communities, I would be wrong. But a lot of people just didn't have too much history, uh, knowledge of India or um, 
the arts there and the and all the you know rich culture other than those images they would get of people who were hungry that's all they knew <laughs> so you know yeah. i think i think there's just more education generally when you get more people from certain cultures around you you just start to learn more about those cultures and that's got to be a little bit reassuring to people they don't have anything to compare it to like i would but it still has to be reassuring to people who are from other places that people in this country just know about the world more in general. And um, I hope that means, you know, people become more receptive to, to that. You know, that's what I, I, I just, I feel like I was really, ha really had an excellent um, place to grow up because I, I never felt um, that isolation. It was just a, uh, way culture was, you know, and now that I'm an adult looking back, I can see, oh, you know, I, I, I can see where maybe I didn't, I knew that people didn't understand India at all. And that's how it caused me to maybe not talk about it very much. And, you know, the kids just act differently. <laughs> they don't know how to deal with some of these big issues. So for me, it made me more quiet about it. Mm -hmm. Like letting that sink in, just because yeah. I feel like that was really insightful. I, um, I, I do want to say, like, I think a lot of people think they know about India, but like researching this, I was like, there's so many different regions and cultures and dialects and languages. It's like you kind of see it with like Native American identity too, where people think it's a mono, like a like a like a not like I want to say like monotheistic. I know that's not the right word, but like a, a monolith, like one, a monolithic culture. But it's not really, it's like a whole bunch of cultures. And I was we're like re researching this episode. I was like reminded of that and how they're all different regions and the, the even the like food's completely different in different Very regions. different, yeah. And it, it's all very tasty in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> you can really, if you were um, interested in it, you certainly could feast for many days going, just doing the different cuisines of India. Very much so. That sounds like a wonderful vacation. <laughs> yeah. I need to branch away from the tikka masala, which is the, the national dish of oh, India. That's, 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 that's a good one to start with. <laughs> it absolutely is. So. Um, so, I mean, today it's common to see, you know, international food aisles at the grocery store, but um, we have access to specific marketplaces. You know, we have just here in Wichita, Hispanic, Asian, Middle Eastern markets. Um, but this was not the case uh, when you were growing up in Pittsburgh. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like, what can uh, we learn from these places and their people through these now uh, wide, um, I'm just really fumbling yeah. through this, but <laughs> um, what can we learn uh, about these people and their, and their places? Well, I think that's a wonderful question. That's one of those questions I just love I because, got it out. you know, I can. Yeah, you did. And you did get it out quite well, I have to say, Sarah. So oh, um, thank you. it's just, uh, you know, it's it's a lovely question because, you know, that the answer to that depends on each individual and, and their amount of curiosity about the world around them. You know, so I was, a, you know, teacher. I was an educator for a long time. So I love questions like that because <laughs> it's just, it makes you sort of um, think about, you know, if, if you look at your plate and in Pittsburgh, oh my goodness, if you look at the classic plate in Pittsburgh, Kansas, of one of our famous chicken restaurants, mm. you will see wonderful kind of Southern fried chicken. You will see German potato salad, this vinegary kind, you'll see slaw, which is also vinegar based, and you'll see spaghetti. Now that's probably one of those unusual combinations, but it really reflects who settled Southeast Kansas, right? The people from the Balkans, the Italians that came for the mining, the strip pit mining. And you know what's really fascinating to me, what I love about that? Is they all ate at the same restaurants. There wasn't an Italian restaurant here and a you know a German rest Balkan, air, you know, heritage restaurant here they ate at the same restaurants their food was touching on the plate we if you look at the plate we were integrated on the plate we were very much one culture on the plate and i'd just like to you know have people recognize that and when they look down at your anywhere you are in this country there's things from all over the world on that plate and you don't even realize it because it's so common now but something as simple as black pepper which was carted out of india uh, in the 1500s and late 1400s by the shipload to go west, 
is from Asia. I mean, we wouldn't have had that in this country. And yet that's a basic. So if you look at at any plate anywhere and you just have a little curiosity, you're going to find trails all over the world. And it, it's fascinating to me. I can't help but think that way. <laughs> I get excited about those kinds of things. I'm also really fascinated by, you know, who handled that food? How did it get packaged? Where? How did it get shipped originally? Maybe now it's all high tech and in, you know, cardboard boxes or something, but it came by ship at one point, or maybe, maybe it was uh, overland the spice Right route and then by ship or you know how did it how did it get to the west and vice versa how did things that came from the new world go west, uh, east and it's just fascinating to see those trails but also what caused them to happen sometimes it's conflict and not great reasons sometimes it's education and you know work experiences that cr- make people crisscross the globe but it's always got an interesting story and it almost. Uh, anytime I've, I've never found a time when it hasn't reflected big movements in history. And uh, so I find it endlessly interesting. <laughs> I can yeah. probably, I don't know. Did I get off topic on your question? No, I, think that, that's I, right. I really liked listening to it. Yeah. So I don't have any problems with that. Yeah. I think it's really <laughs> fascinating how like, like things exist, like outside, like how like globalism and col- colonialism has changed culture is like, yeah. I just mm-hmm. think that's super fascinating and it's really and it's it's interesting because not everybody realizes how it affects something they do daily, like eating. You know, yeah. it's just amazing. Uh, I think you started out, Sarah, saying, you know, these foods that are currently you can find a lot of interesting spices and ingredients from all over the world in our grocery you go store. Kroger and get a curry powder. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's really, really nice and and convenient. You can take test many things without having to really uh, go afar. I, I know when my parents got to Pittsburgh in 1963, um, something like yogurt was not in the grocery store. That was exotic. And, you know, Indians cook with a lot of yogurt. That's just part of our cooking process. She didn't have, you couldn't find cinnamon sticks in the grocery. You would, we would go to the Ben Franklin in the one of the craft aisles where they would have bag of cinnamon sticks. People would buy for those oranges you'd get at Christmas time and stick the cinnamon stick in there. So spices weren't, you know, real exotic. They, they, they call, I don't call it exotic, but that's, I'll put quotes around that. Word. Um, so uh, we've come a long way. And uh, I think that having access to all of these foods you know, if you have the curiosity, it might spark uh, interest in how those foods were used in the cultures they came from, or even where they came from, came from to begin with. You might have some interest in that, and and how we got it here, and and how it is changed by the cultures it's in, because that's what also fascinating. These foods as they move, like the tomato when it got to Italy, or that same tomato when it got to India totally different cuisines because of the ingenuity of the people who use this foreign quote unquote ingredient from South America and made it their own. And so that's the title of my most recent book is uh, Green Chili and Other Imposters because these foods kind of become so much a part of things that you don't know they were foreign to begin with and thought of as outside kind of uh, the cuisine. And so they're sort of imposters, and I, and I'm also kind of tongue in cheek talking about myself because when I go back to Asia, I look like I sort of belong there, but I'm definitely a Midwestern person. <laughs> so it's a you know it, it's a little bit of a um, it's interesting to me how things get made your own. You know, like when is it foreign and when does it stop being foreign? And if we know what that point is, can we apply it at will? <laughs> you know, because right. it's uh, it seems to just sort of take over a culture with time. But at some point, somebody makes the leap to making this their own. And I, I just find that an interesting point, that boundary. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I've been trying to say that the fried flour taco is Wichita's, like, our food. <laughs> like, other places have originated, but I was like, no, I've been around a lot of other places. No one else has fried flour tacos. And it's because, like, we have, we're, like, the the grain belt or whatever. And it's, like, yeah. it's, like, okay, instead of, like, a corn, it's, like, it's, it's, flour. it's, like, they take a flour tortilla, they make a taco, and then they fry it. Oh. And it's, like, 
Yeah, it tastes kind of like, like tequila. No, because they normally have toothpicks in it to kind of seal it. It's kind of like a like, and it's a not completely sealed empanada is what uh-huh. I would say. But I'm gonna have to taste one of those. So yeah. I have to come. Yes, I, I don't. I haven't even had one. It's yeah, it's like a thing. It's not at the authentic Mexican restaurants though. It's at the like <laughs> Tex Mex, like the like. Those kind of places, but it's like a thing that distinctly I feel like I've only found in Wichita and like one other other place, like in Oklahoma. That and just, I just sounds like it ought to be a state fair food because it's a deep yeah. fried. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. It's like it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not authentic taco, but it's authentic to Kansas. And I've always right. had this argument to put people Absolutely. like, no, it's yeah. they're like it's not a real taco. It's like no, but it's a Kansas taco. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Love it. Love awesome. It. Hmm. Well, um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, um, we're going to actually talk a little bit more about uh, green chilies and other imposters and a few other things. Um, So we'll be right back. Get free access to popular ebook, e audiobook, and digital magazine titles at your fingertips with the Libby app. Download Libby from your phone or tablet's app store, sign in with your Wichita Public Library card, and start reading today. Don't have a library card yet? No problem. You can access Libby with an instant digital card using your mobile phone number if you have a 316 area code. For more information on Libby, please visit wichita.overdrive.com. All right, welcome back to Read, Return, Repeat. We are talking with Nina Mukherjee first, first now. Um, Nina, in your book, Fighting Through the Skin, you talk about your time in the U.S. Peace Corps, um, and there was a particularly memorable passage about your stay in Tunisia and bonding with the other women there over the food and the cooking. Um, Can you talk to us about that? What drew you to this kind of work in the Peace Corps? Yeah, um, my husband and I went in as a couple, and I think we were drawn, we were, you know, right out of college. I think we were drawn to the adventure of it. Um, I also, because of how I grew up, I've always been fascinated with different cultures and, you know, how how we meet them and how we learn about them. And so I was ready and, and he certainly was, was. so we applied. Um, I, at that time, I don't know if it's still the same, you get assigned a country or, you you know, they they tell you where you'll be going. So we didn't know it was going to be North Africa. Um, and when we went, I, uh, I, I, my job was, he, uh, let me back up. He, they placed him as a uh, agricultural extension worker in a, in a town uh, in the middle of the country. So it was very close to the Sahara Desert and um, very old Medinas and, you know, lovely uh, flat topped white houses with blue doors, that kind of um, type of scenery. And also really rough kind of scrub brushy um, countryside because it was going into the Sahara. So it wasn't quite Sahara yet. And it was olive trees and that kind of thing. So he was out in the country most of the time and I uh, was assigned or I, I requested to work with the women of uh, that worked with widowed farmers. And so I spent my time um, trying to figure out ways to get income generation to these ladies. A lot of them were rug weavers. And so we had a project to get certificates for rug weaving uh, to these ladies because if they had the certificate, they could get paid more at the market. So that was my big project. So a lot of my time was spent working on, you know, technical things like how many bricks do we need to build this facility? <laughs> and nothing very exciting. But but uh, in the kitchens, when I would work with these ladies to make traditional foods from North Africa, we that's where all my memories really are. And I'm hoping that's where their memories of me are, because that's where we had all of our exchanges about who we were as people, as women, as uh, daughters, as wives, and kind of, you know, I learned so much about what they felt about families and just by how they cooked. You know, it's like women exchange a lot of wisdom in those, in that space, that space where you're actually, it's, you're working, but it's uh, not, uh, it's leisurely in some ways, even though you have a big job ahead of you. And, um, it, it was just precious, you know, it was just a precious time. And I think that's where my love uh, really was born for this type of work, because what I saw was 
these ladies were kind of um, about two kilometers outside of the main town. Their families had moved to this area because uh, they were no longer jobs out in the rural areas. And so they came there for work. And a lot of times their husbands didn't find the work. So the women were doing weaving and uh, household things and cooking and just trying to make ends meet. So I saw from their stature, I'm, I'm not terribly tall. I'm about 5'3", a little bit less. And the men were about my height and the women were shorter. Uh, but just two kilometers in town where most of the people or many of the people were professionals, you know, doctors, uh, teachers, engineers. They had incomes that were good. Uh, they had access to many more nutrients in their food and a lot more protein. Uh, the men were over six foot tall. You know, you could just see the difference. And um, they were both uh, populations were eating similar foods in a way. They were uh, the traditional hair, what I call heritage recipes, couscous with a spicy tomato sauce, some vegetables, maybe some chickpeas, things like that were the same. But in the area where I lived and worked, there would be very very rarely any meat and very rarely any protein other than maybe a chickpea or two thrown into the pot. And um, it just made a huge difference also because I think the quality of what was the staple foods of the grains, the best of it was exported. And so the least of it was what the people at the subsistence level of the culture were eating. And so micronutrient deficiency means uh, statures are shorter. Sometimes there's other deficiencies and you could just see it. These foods that sustained cultures for millennia no longer were sustaining these people. And it's because of something that shifted in the soils. It's something that shifted in the food uh, system. And that is how I became really fascinated with that aspect of of food writing. I love the cultural aspect, but I'm really interested in human nutrition and, and heritage foods and what happens when they start to change. If they change because we just want novelty and we want something interesting because we're going to combine in the case of uh, the example a minute ago of tacos and something in the Midwest, like a fried flour tortilla, um, that that's different. Uh, but if it's changing because the food system is changing and we're not getting the micronutrients that we used to get, then it really shows up in certain populations that don't have the money to add to that and to add to that diet. So I think that interest was born at that time in the Peace Corps. But my interest in cultural boundaries and how they meet and are crossed over food definitely happened in those kitchens with those ladies. And I, I know that that's what has led me to what I have been doing ever since. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's real. Do you never think about like the quality of food versus in, because of that, the mm -hmm. relating to like size and stature and things. And well, yeah. just the fact that it's degraded over yeah. time. I think that that's, um, yeah, we, we have such wonderful agricultural soils in this part of the country yeah. in the world. But, you know, many places, and I've worked in a few of them, soils are really depleting. And um, yeah. if you um, uh, overuse soils and, and, you, and I, you know, fertilizers, of course, help. But even using so much fertilizer is it's a difference between a soil that's alive with natural micronutrients. That's the kind of soil you really want to grow food in. And we've kind of uh, lost a lot of that around the world. So I did a couple of projects in, um, in Ghana and Mozambique, and that's what we folks focused on. And it, it was for human nutrition using heritage recipes when you have plants grown in soils that are depleted. What, what happens, you know? So how do you get the protein back up? How do you get micronutrients back in the food? So I I could go, I get a little bit wonky. Yeah, that's the, this topic. <laughs> the deep science of nutrition. <laughs> I'll stop. I promise. <laughs> no, I mean it's, it's really it's fascinating, but yeah, I I'll, guess we don't want our podcast to be like a I'll, thousand hours long. So all, yeah, all I know about Tunisia is, is from like seeing it in Star Wars. It's like where I first yeah, it's it's beautiful. Beautiful. yeah, it has such fascinating things that were captured in that film. So yeah. yeah. Um, your book was selected as a Kansas Notable book in 2014. Congratulations on that. Thank what was you. your 
Uh, what was your reaction to getting awarded the title? I was thrilled. I was just thrilled. You know, when I was in six, seven, eight years old, I was writing what was, you know, if you read it now, it'd be pretty bad poetry. <laughs> but the, um, um, I was selected to be in the Young Kansas Writers Magazine at the time. And we got little awards and got published, right? So when I got the Kansas Notable Book, I was thrilled, first of all, to be recognized by my home state is just really an honor. Um, but part of the award was we came to the Capitol. We got to see the beautiful Capitol building. Uh, we were invited to the governor's mansion. We The next day during the festival, the book festival, they had the winners of the young writers around the state of Kansas came. And it just came full circle to me because here I was as an adult receiving the notable book and then the young Kansas writers were there getting their awards. And just to be part of that cycle uh, meant a lot to me. And I think it's a wonderful program that Kansas does. I really do. It's, it's as a young person who was interested in writing, uh, I'm sure that is also uh, one of those things that enabled me to, to even think it could happen. Um, I think that the uh, State Library also takes great care to make sure a lot of our public libraries around the state have access to all of the titles that get awarded the Kansas uh, Notable Book. So mm. anyway. Wonderful. Yeah. And we we're really fortunate to have a, a great Kansas State Library. System. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, uses the services a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great program. Yeah. So, um. Your latest book, uh, it came out last year. It's called Green Chili and Other Imposters. Can you tell our listeners a little about the book? Mm -hmm, sure. So I mentioned before a little bit how foods moved around the world for various reasons. And I was especially looking at how foods moved under colonialism in India and how certain foods coming into India were actually not originally from India, but are thought of as essential to the um, cuisine now like green chilies, but other foods like tomatoes and potatoes and various um, things that you might know if you are if you know about how foods came, um, moved around the world after the Columbus hit South America or got to South America. So Vasco da Gama came to India in 1498. And within three years of his landing, green chilies started sprouting up all around where he came in to the country. And it was a wonderful way for if you were poor to get vitamin C in your diet, it also um, added novelty and excitement to your meals if you were having bland foods or foods that were always the same. Um, it also, this plant grows in about any climate and about any soil, it just grows very easily. So the Portuguese weren't too worried about allowing green chili seeds to get into India because Indians we're not going to be big buyers of the spices the Portuguese were reselling in Europe. They were already growing the spices, so they didn't care. And so the chilies went everywhere and um, took longer for it to go up north where my family's from. And it's still to this day, the foods are a lot hotter around where he hit, came into India in the southwest coast, the Malabar coast. Um, but the, the chilies, when it, if you think about how they moved west, um, if you think about the countries that have a little spicier foods, um, it was only because those ships allowed chilies to leave and get out of the ports. Uh, they were not interested, commerce people were not interested in having chilies go everywhere in Europe because that meant people might not buy those spices that they were selling for quite a bit. So if you look at the path of the spice ships, most of the countries that are not do not have spicy food, it's because they were selling these other spices to them and they did not want green chilies to get off the ships. And so it it's really interesting if you want to look at it historically, where those spices are and why. And you, you can see it with lemons. Lemons came from Asia to, to the West. So you can see certain islands that are full of citrus uh, groves. Well, that's where the ship stops. And they didn't want the sailors needed that vitamin C. So it was, uh, they planted those plantations so they could have kind of a health, health stop on the way uh, their long voyages. So it, it's just fascinating to me to see the world history in terms of trails because it, it reveals a lot about what we do now and how we, our cuisines have developed. 
Awesome. I've been uh, reading a lot about pirates lately, and it's you find <laughs> out how important spices were back then. Like, mm-hmm. like people lived and died over sugar. Like, I know. <laughs> so I know. I like that's a like really interesting thing that like we don't think about. We take it for granted. So it's really cool yes. to read hear about it. And I didn't know that about the green chilies at all. That's really cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm really I haven't I've not read this one, but I'm really looking. Forward I'm on to the list for it. It. Oh, good. Well, I good. hope you guys enjoy it. It it was a uh, it was just a thrill to write because it connected uh, all those kinds of broader stories to how it impacted my own experience of uh, the foods my mother made. So it kind of connects to fighting through the skin a little bit because it's like one generation back from that book. We decided to focus on fighting through the skin since this category is about um, an immigration story. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I really am looking forward to it. Now, it, so so we talked about um, the the colonialism and how that kind of affected it, but in a lot of um, other communities that have also been affected by that European colonialism, there's a movement to kind of return back to the roots and recreate recipes. I guess would that be considered a heritage recipe? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I think um, you know I think more of the young and um, interesting chefs coming up that are combining foods in new ways as, as the way foods are going okay. in a lot of, a lot of times you'll see like in Nashville, there's a chef that combines Indian food, like the tikka masala that, uh, Daniel mentioned with, uh, poutine, you know, so, so it, it's like Southern food or even, you know, in some ways that's Canadian, but foods that are more, um, associated with U.S. history and then put some Indian spin on it. So I see that a lot. Um, heritage foods, yes, I think that that authentic uh, foods like that and who is able to cook them, if they need to be from that culture. You know, I, I tend to think if you, if you acknowledge uh, where these foods are coming from and how they, uh, how they show a culture, foods have always been innovative. I mean, there's never been a time, you can't really say cuisine is, is held fast in uh, uh, under a glass because whenever a, a cuisine developed, it was because those foods would grow in that area, and then the people of that community would make tasty things from it. So it, by definition, is something that changed with what was grown around it. And so I don't know that you can freeze it, but I do value heritage foods and flavors a lot, and I feel like. They're kind of a world heritage. They're a, and it's a world heritage loss if we don't, in some way, uh, preserve those foods. Uh, but I don't know that I mean that it's uh, it needs to be preserved where you can't ever adjust the foods or make something new and interesting from it. I think that it's a living thing. Cuisine is a living, changing body of work by a lot of people, and so I um, I feel like it's it's. It's, it'd be a shame to lose the food history behind it, but I like the development of new ideas around cuisine. So that's my favorite thing about it. I, I think that's really like, there's a balance, right? Because you want like the historicity of the food to remember how it was. Like corn is a good example. There's like heritage corn growers that are trying to like, because corn mm-hmm. like, uh, be, you know, be, as a cash crop has like become very distant from what it used to be. And so, but there's a balance because it's like, food should be allowed to be dynamic and you can change things. And so I think that's really cool that you acknowledge that. And yeah, that's, yeah, it's neat. Um, so every day we hear stories of groups of people all over the world who are forced to leave their homes due to circumstances outside their control. What role, what role do you think food can have in making people feel at home in un- unfamiliar environments? I think it's a really powerful way to make people feel comfortable. It's just, it kind of works at a subconscious level. You know that phrase we have, we say, you know, at your gut level, <laughs> that's, it's a gut level of culture. And, um, you know, foods are very sensory and they tie us across boundaries of all kinds. So geographical, political, gender, but also uh, between, we talked about just a minute ago, between now and that other place, the past, you know, because our senses work the same, whether you live now or you lived 200 years ago. So if you can write to that, you connect people. So something that powerful, if you are uprooted for any reason or just 
you know, changed her home because of uh, migration or uh, for any reason, um, having that taste of home uh, makes you feel very grounded and welcome. And I think it's super, super important that uh, we try and create that for people who've gone through so much. If, if we're talking about situations that I think of in the news right now, other people move for jobs or, you know, education, but it's still, it's still a very powerful um, thing to be able to create the taste of home. We're all so connected to it, you know, that uh, there's this folklore in India that if you're leaving for any period of time, you should eat all the foods from, that are grown right around your hometown um, as much of it as you can to store your, you know, store up to keep you healthy until you get back. And that's because those foods of home are supposed to be what sustains you. So if you ever have to leave and maybe you don't know if you can get back, having that taste of home just signals you subconsciously that you're safe. You know, you've got a, a place to be uh, that's going to sustain you. And I, I just think it's a powerful thing. I really could talk about food like yeah. all day. Um, <laughs> food's my favorite thing. So, <laughs> um, okay. So question of the hour. Do you yes. have like a favorite food? I know that's like asking. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's- it's That's a, a really horrific question. question. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, I kind of do. If I had to pick, okay. you know, a food- um, you know, I am, a, I am, as I've been saying, all, all this discussion, I'm a child of the Midwest, but my comfort food is lentils that my mother used to make. Uh, the doll uh, can be made all kinds of ways, and it's very tasty. Um, and I would say, kind of paired with that, because I, you know, probably would never uh, be able to say this wasn't a comfort food, is a dish called kima, and it's, it was minced lamb. And traditionally, it was made with um, peas, which is, you know, not an Indian vegetable. But anyway, it was, think about it, minced meat with these little peas in it and you eat it with rice. Well, my comfort version of that was little tiny cubes of potatoes. So um, my mother would sometimes indulge me by making it that way. But if you think about what that plate was, that was, that was a real mix of cultures right there. And definitely um, a food of the colonial India because the foods came from all over to make that plate. Hmm. And now are any of those, uh, the, your preferred doll recipe, is it in your book? It is. Actually, that book, Biting Through the Skin, has all my mother's recipes that she created in Kansas, or most of them. And they are, um, they're easy to make because, you know, she had to, by necessity, make it from things that she could find. So it, it, they are really tasty. <laughs> they're my, my childhood foods. And I have to say, I'm very biased. So I hope you try them. And uh, so give them a shot and see what you think. Okay. Well, I'm going to try it then. Yeah. <clears throat> One final question. What can we learn from our immigrant neighbors in our community and beyond? Well, that's a big question because, yeah, you know, it's... oh, uh, I it, again, it goes back to that. Um, one answer I gave a few minutes ago, it's just like individual curiosity. If you've got the curiosity, it's really limitless what you can learn from a neighbor, you know, and they can be from a different culture. They can be from Kansas, um, but you never know what's in their backstory. And it's, it's interesting when I taught at the University of Missouri, around my table would be all these students. They all looked like you, Daniel and Sarah, and everybody looked like they were pretty, I mean, fairly Midwestern. Nothing looked very surprising. But I asked them for their comfort food stories. And one person had a comfort food story about her Italian mother's particular dish. Another young woman talked about her grandmother's Danish cookies she used to make. And then one lady, actually it was a young man, talked about when her mother, his mother, sorry, um, would get a paycheck. He and his five siblings would sit along the curb and they, she would buy them Captain Crunch cereal and they would eat it straight out of the box. So it was diversity of all kinds, economic as well as cultural diversity behind all these faces that looked homogenous. They really did. So it, I feel like that what you can learn from people uh, that are new to your community or even longtime people in your community 
is is so vast. And if if you're an elder in in your family, share those stories of how how what the foods were, how they came to the plate, who produced them, who made them, because it's a real gift to give the next generation. Most of those stories are never told, yet they're the ones that are easiest for older members of our families to remember and talk about fondly. And they love talking about it. And I can say when I was doing Riding Through the Skin, it was one of the best benefits of doing that book is I got people in my family who didn't really talk about their childhoods to tell me all kinds of things about how they, you know, had meals with their brothers or how their mother was a particular way when she was in the kitchen. It was fascinating to me. And uh, it's a real, real great conversation starter. starter. Next time you have a family holiday, ask someone about that. Yeah, we, yeah. It's, it's fun to listen to the stories. And ours never revolved around food. Um, well, maybe, I guess my grandmother made fried chicken a lot, uh, which is not something that I eat right now. But, um, you know, just sitting around and listening to those old stories of music and getting together and going on trips. And um, it's just, it's really fun to listen to our um, older generation. Absolutely. Well, and that's yeah, really all that's the questions what we, have. we have for you today, Nina. Thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, I appreciate it very much, Sarah and Daniel. You guys are great. And I, I think a lot of the library system that puts a program like this on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, it was really a pleasure just learning from you. And I think you blew my mind about five times. And <laughs> yeah. I could talk about food all day. I'll say it again. So yeah. final thoughts? No, I actually just want to go get Indian food now. I'm just, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like thinking about it. I was going to get ramen today, but I think I might switch it up <laughs> and go to an Indian restaurant. So You go for it. It's It'll make you feel good. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to talk to us. Thanks for having me. Take care, Take you guys. Care. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye. Bye. Are you wanting to learn a new language but don't have the time or money for your formal classes? With your Wichita Public Library card, you can learn for free on your own schedule with Mango Languages. With over 50 languages to choose from, your journey to fluency can begin with the click of a button. Available on your desktop and as a mobile app, you can choose where and when to learn. To start your language learning journey, visit wichitalibrary.org, click on Research and Learn, and select Learn a Language. Before we wrap up today's episode, let's listen to three reading recommendations from our Wichita Public Library staff. Hi, I'm Suzanne Laycock, and I work as a library assistant in youth services at the Wichita Public Library. My book recommendation for Read ICT, category number nine, An Immigration Story, is A Good Provider is One Who Leaves, by Jason DeParle. This nonfiction selection was in the making for three decades. DeParl met and lived with the Komodos family in the Philippines while researching poverty and health issues in the 1980s. What began for him as an investigation into poverty ends up becoming a sweeping tale across decades, continents, and generations about the forces behind contemporary human migration. I think readers will find this book very moving in how it contrasts the intimate personal description of one family with the historic and current global economic forces shaping human movement between poor countries to wealthier ones. DePaul crafts a hopeful story out of the years of suffering and sacrifice the Komodases endure because it's impossible for readers to forget that this family's experiences and feelings are what others have undergone all over the world. Most of us in the United States have an almost innate understanding that we would not be here if it weren't for at least one family member enduring, surviving, sacrificing, and ultimately thriving in the same way the Komodases do. As this book lays out, that hope is part of the human spirit all over the world. I encourage you to try A Good Provider is One Who Leaves for a moving exploration about human migration in the 21st century. For more reading recommendations, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. 
Hello, my name is Miwa Van, and I'm in the Interlibrary Loan Department at the Wichita Public Library. My book recommendation for the Read ICT Category 9, An Immigration Story, is The Lever by Lisa Ko. The story takes place in both China and New York as two stories unfold and intertwine with one another. Deming lived in China for the first five years of his life and immigrated to live with his mother in New York. After the disappearance of his mother, Deming was placed in foster care and adopted by a couple upstate. He is encouraged to assimilate to his new suburban life and given the name Daniel Wilkinson. There are very few people of color and many alienated Daniel because he didn't look like them. Over the years, he built a gambling addiction to cope mentally. Polly lives in China where she works as a teacher after staying in a detention camp for 14 months and deported back from America. She lives through regrets from her past and accepts her mundane life, but constantly dreams of a life that is so much more. She is free-spirited and doesn't like being tied down. Both characters struggle with adversity as they face memories of the past and frustration of a life that is unfulfilling. Feeling like misfits, Daniel and Polly confide in one another as they find their sense of self and belonging. The feelings of guilt and fear they convey as they both work through their trauma and find peace in their life. The author writes about sensitive mental challenges that are generally not addressed when discussing immigration. It is a side that is overshadowed when there are other hardships at hand. This usually isn't my type of read, but the feelings from the book can be resonated with, especially when trying not to lose oneself when choosing between cultural differences. This book won the 2016 Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. It was also a finalist for the 2017 National Book Award for Fiction and the 2018 Penn Hemingway Award. For more reading recommendations, please visit wichalibrary.org forward slash read ICT. Hi, my name is Erin Downey Howerton and I'm the Youth Services Manager at the Wichita Public Library. And today I'm going to talk about an immigration story. It's category nine of Read ICT. My recommendation is The Arrival by Sean Tan. It's a graphic novel without any decipherable words, rendered in sepia tones, sometimes reminiscent of old photographs in a family album. In this story, Tan shows us a family that is in danger of some sort. The danger is represented by long shadows cast on the walls of their city that resemble scaly dragon tails. The father is packing for a trip, and readers will quickly realize that he is leaving his wife and daughter behind on a long voyage. He's going ahead to secure a better future for them, but the worlds he encounters are strange. Tan's use of written characters, not quite Latin or Cyrillic or any other writing we might be familiar with, it helps to reinforce that idea that this long journey has culminated in a land that's just as strange to us as it is to the father, our main character. Repetitive imagery of rebirth and liberation in the shapes of eggs and birds set the tone in this new country, where the father has to show his strange new papers to the authorities, try to make friends, eat all new foods, and get a job. All of these things are hampered, of course, by the mysterious language that he hasn't yet mastered and his unfamiliar surroundings. Young readers are always fond of the new country's neat little pets, odd little creatures with funny tails, giant eyes, gills, and other characteristics that we wouldn't recognize. Perhaps my favorite part of this book are the conversations that the father has with other immigrants in the new country, where they describe the dangers they've escaped and the new lives they've forged in hopes of a better tomorrow. I've always found the arrival to be a story with a big impact due to its unconventional form, the choice to exclude understandable language, and the way that it plunges you into new surroundings to decipher your way forward just like the father does. And of course, the anticipation that the family might one day get to join him in this land of renewal and new hope. Shantan is an Australian author and illustrator who drew from his own family's immigration experience to create this narrative. His father came to Australia from Malaysia in the 1960s to study architecture, and Tan also studied other people's immigration stories to create this work. In doing so, he was, quote, reminded that migration is a fundamental part of human history, both in the distant and in the recent past. Wow, what a great interview. Yeah, I didn't think an interview could make me hungry. Absolutely. A list of books discussed in today's episode can be found in the accompanying show notes. To request any of the books heard about in today's episode, visit widgetallibrary.org or call us at 316-261-8500. As we end today's episode, we'll leave you with a short story titled Simple Gifts, a submission to our local short story program from Youth Services Librarian Sarah McNeil 
who you might remember as the season one host of this very podcast. This is one of the many short stories and poems you can get from one of our short story dispensers, located at Reverie Roasters Coffee Shop, Evergreen Community Library, and the Eisenhower Airport. And if you have a short story under 8,000 characters to submit, you can visit wichitalibrary.org slash short story to submit it. Simple Gifts for Ruby. Ruby walked up a long hill with her dog. It was a perfect summer night to sleep out under the stars. She touched the long blue stem grass in her grandfather's pasture. Tonight, she was going to camp out. Just her and Bear. She felt the cool breeze shift and saw dark clouds on the horizon. Quickly, she gathered a large bunch of grass and began to weave. As if by magic, she had woven a tarp for shelter. She tied the tarp between two trees in the middle of a hill. She quickly gathered rocks to divert water from getting her and Bear wet. Rain began to fall, drop by drop, and then it grew darker and quiet. May I please share your shelter, hissed a voice in the dark. Ruby was so scared that she did not open her eyes. Who are you? asked Ruby softly. I'm a bull snake. I promise not to bite you. If you agree... I will show you a path to the fresh spring of water. Pretty please, repeated the voice. All right, said Ruby meekly, if you promise. The rain began to fall faster. Ruby heard another sound, but this time it was a different cry for help. Who's there? she asked. It's me, Deer Mouse. I can't seem to find my hole. Can I squeeze in beside you, please? If you allow me some space, I will find you fresh berries in the morning for breakfast, squeaked the mouse. Mouse turned and squealed, Eep! A snake! It's okay, mouse. Snake has promised not to bite us while he is here. You will be fine. Isn't that so, snake? Ruby asked. Certainly so, said snake. The rain was coming down sideways now. came an unfamiliar sound. Who's there? asked Ruby. It's me, Brown Bat. May I please rest under your shelter? The rain is so thick now I can't find my way home. I will clear away any mosquitoes that will bother you near the spring so you may eat your breakfast in peace. Yes, you may, said Ruby. They all sat together, Bat, Mouse, Snake, Bear, and Ruby, under the tarp until all were fast asleep. Ruby awoke in the morning to find that all of her visitors had gone, all that is but Bear, her dog. Sure enough, Snake had kept his promise and laid down a path to the pool of spring water. There, by the bank, was a pile of berries left by Mouse, and all Ruby could hear was the gentle sway of the breeze rustling leaves in the trees, not one mosquito in sight. Many thanks, she said silently to her new friends. She ate her berries, drank the cool water, and laughed to herself. She couldn't wait to tell Grandpa about her camp out under the stars. Thank you to Nina for talking with us today, and thanks to the staff for offering those great recommendations for Category 9 and Immigration Story. And thank you all for listening. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag Read ICT Challenge on Facebook and click join. You can follow this podcast through the Anchor app or stream episodes on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe and share with all your friends. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to our production crew and the podcast team. 